Welcome back to Phil Paper Roulette, new day of COVID-19, and so we're going to get some more random stuff off Phil Papers and see what it says. Uh, hopefully I got the music going again, if you can hear it, good, if not, it's on loop anyway, so you might get bored. So let's see what have we got today. New journal articles. You might have remembered yesterday we did the imagination and distinction between image and intuition in Kant. That was cool. It was just very taxing on me because I'm not a Kantian and it was long. Uh, meta. Wittgenstein's affirmation of mysticism in his private language argument. Uh, I'll take a look at that. This is a review. Hmm. Well, if I can't get a hold of it. Alright, ain't no links, ain't no nothing, so can't do much there. Hmm. Maybe go back to thought. Um. Oh, yeah, I really. This is too bad. I want to do point careers conventionalism, but that's uh, in a language I don't speak. So let's go hit up thought again. And, uh. At least that'll be a nice warm up. If anything else. <laughs> Where am I? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, what do we got going here? Individuating log. That's a great last name, Wigglesworth. But, alright, individuating logic's a category theoretic approach. Yeah. Well, let's see if there's. I mean, if there's no. abstract, it's, um, kind of tough to judge anything. Um. If it's here. Uh, PDF Wiley, I probably can't, don't have access to it. Hey, here we go, alright. See if we can bother. Semantic approach versus purely syntactic. I argue that neither of these approaches satisfactory as both treat arguably distinct logics as equivalent logical theories. I argue instead for a approach by syntactic and semantic com components. The specific approach to a combined account of logical theories is based on the category theoretic notion of an intuition. Well, why not warm up today with this? Okay. So here we go. Hmm. Before I forget, this is kind of nice to do. There we go. In Wigglesworth 2017, I argue, and it's always interesting, you see, you must have modified that after uh, it was reviewed because referencing yourself in the first line, unless that sort of breaks the, the review process, you're not supposed to refer to yourself, but that's okay. In Wigglesworth 2017, I argue against a purely syntactic conception of logical theories. The argument proceeds by showing that a plausible syntactic account of theoretical equivalence when applied to logical theories has the unfortunate consequence that it makes classical and intuitionist logic equivalent. Uh... Okay, if you say so, I have not read your previous work. I don't know how purely syntactic stuff uh, would make two different logics equivalent. Based on this argument, I suggested a purely semantic concept of logical theories, understanding them in terms of categories of models. In response, Jack Woods has proposed a stronger syntactic account of theoretical equivalence, according to which classical and intuitionist logic are not equivalent. Based on this proposal, Woods argues that a purely syntactic account of logical theories remains possible. 
In this note, I show that both purely syntactic accounts and purely semantic accounts are subject to counterexamples that bring them into question. I then propose an account that combines syntactic and semantic components, which avoids these counterexamples. The specific, the specific approach to a combined account of logical theories is based on the category theoretic notion of an institution. Oh, I said intuition before. I was like, oh man, more intuition. Of an institution. What's an institution? All right, we'll find out. I was like, at least I've... <laughs> it's like, you know, intuition, at least that's a normal philosopher uh, w a weasel word where you just appeal to intu intuitions. But if you're appealing to institution, what is this? Like an in institutional theory of art or philosophy where you're like, whatever a uh, logic is is what the institu institutional people say a logic is? We'll find out. To summarize the arguments in Wigglesworth 2017 and Woods 2018, take a theory to be a set of sentences closed under a relation of logical consequence. Given a set of sentences S and the theory that S generates by closing S under a logic L, the, theory, the set T L S with this definition in hand, there is a natural syntactic criterion for the equivalence of logical theories. The syntactic criterion involves the notion of a mapping tau from the language. Uh, this is why I don't do logic because I'm gonna have to read all these things. Tau from the language of one theory T to the language of another theory, the language of another T prime. The mapping must satisfy certain requirements. In the context of logical theories, it should at least com commute with the negation operator so that tau of uh, negative phi or not phi is uh, implies or whatever we're going to take the symbol to be not tau. So uh, yeah, negation commutes. You can pull a negation out of a formula and put it in front of the uh, tau, which the mapping is. So either tau will map a not phi to not tau to phi. So if the negation maps, then the not mapping maps the uh, unnegated formula. The mapping tau is then a translation from t to t prime, for if and only if for all phi is element t, uh, tau of phi is an element of t prime. Theories t and t prime are intertranslatable if and only if there are translations tau t to t prime and sigma t prime back to t. Okay, so it goes back and forth with tau and sigma. Two logics L1 and L2 are then syntactically equivalent if and only if for all sentences S, T, and L1, S is intertranslated with T, L2, S. So you got two languages. <clears throat> the argument in Wigglesworth 2017 showed that under this syntactic criterion, classical intuitionist logic are equivalent as for any sentence, a set of sentences S, the classical theory S is intertranslatable with the intuitionist theory of S. Yes, you can do that. That's right. Translations between the classical intuitionist theories of, of, of any S are given in one direction by the girdle Genson translation from the classical theory to the intuitionistic theory and in the other direction by identity mapping. As classical and intuitionist logic should not be equivalent logical theories, well, what do you mean by logical then? I mean, if you define it in the uh, mapping way, then they should, they should be equivalent logical theories. Maybe they're philosophically different, but they're logically the same. I argue that purely syntactic approaches to theoretical equivalence are inappropriate for logical theories. Okay, but that, you have to explain what you mean by logical then, too. I suggested that a semantic approach might yield better results in this particular case, and I considered an account of theoretical equivalence given in terms of categoric, categories, categories of models. According to this semantic account, one can show that classical and intuitionistic log, classical and intuitionistic logic are not equivalent, as they should not be. Woods 2018 argues that there is a stronger syntactic criterion that is able to distinguish between classical and intuitionistic logic. The stronger criterion is achieved by making three refinements to the intertranslatability account. Recall that the current intertranslatability inter account determines two logical theories, L1 and L2, to be syntactically equivalent when, for all S, there are translations tau from L1 to L2 and sigma L2 back to L1. Not necessarily back to, but goes in the other direction. If you started off with L2, you could just be there. 
The first refinement to this count allows for comparisons between logics with different logical expressions. For example, we might find we might want to compare theories formulated in the language of disjunction, negation, and true with theories formulated in the language of conjunction, ne negation, and false. Sure. Or we might want to compare notational variations of a given logical theory. For example, one that uses standard interpretations of uh, as a vel and uh, what are these stupid things called? Well, and and or, and ones that treat and as disjunction and or is conjunction. Okay, so we've got a, yeah, you could just make notational changes and then translate between them. Though my original presentation of the intertranslatability account does not explicitly rule out these comparisons, more must be said about how they would work. To apply the equivalence conditions in cases like these, one can take translations to be relative to mappings between the logical expressions of the relevant languages. Let T map the logical expressions of L1 to those of L2, and let T of S be the result of applying this mapping to the sentences in S. Let U be a mapping in the other direction. The first refinement then is that then the first refinement then results in the following prop proposal for syntactic equivalence. Two logical theories, L1 and L2, are syntactically equivalent when, for all S, there are translations tau L1 to L2, and then you see the difference here is that S is a... Uh, now you have a function T that uh, refines the S for um, these notational differences, um, so you can map the expressions that actually... Uh, changes the uh so the, the logical constants are in some sense different here so you're just along with the uh other stuff you're mapping whatever it is the content the con uh yeah so the content is being mapped and so are the uh expressions okay the second refinement rolls out different translation for different sets S. The intertranslatability criterion for syntactic equivalence between logics L1 and L2 requires that for any S there's some translation from the theory that S generates according to L1, the theory that S generates according to L2. Uh, yeah, so it results in the same stuff. But the translation can be local to S, and each S can use different translation. Yeah, more than one translation. The second refinement requires that general translation such that each use s each s uses the same translation mapping okay so you're fixing the uh way you're converting between the two incorporating this refinement the proposal for syntactic equivalence becomes two logical theories l1 and l2 are syntactically equivalent when there's a translation tau and sigma such that for all s s tau um l1 maps to on the t l1 maps L2, if you also convert the expressions, and sigma goes the other direction. <clears throat> so far, the refinements that Wood proposes do not block translations between classical and intuitionist logic that provide a counterexample to the intertranslatability criterion for theoretical equivalence between logics. No, that wouldn't do it. Um, classical logic and intuitionist logic have the same logical expressions and the relevant translations can be applied to every set s wood proposes a third requirement however which is meant to rule out these perverse translations okay so this is where we're finally getting somewhere because they're perverse i mean you have to ask really what is so bad well what do you want out of your logic and why is it bad to translate between them like if one can do it and the other can do it what are we giving up it I mean, this gets into the philosophy of logic, and it's interesting questions. What do we want from logic? Given two logics L1 L2, this refinement requires that when translating a sentence phi between of the language L1 to a sentence tau phi of the language L2, the sentences phi and tau phi should be logically equivalent according to the logic L2. According uh, and arguing against the intertranslatability account, I used the girdle Genson translation to provide a mapping gamma for any. I uh, keep forgetting if I know my Greek anymore. I can't even remember. For any. I'm just going to call this a gamma. <laughs> for any S from the classical theory S to the intuitionistic theory of S. Alright. The translation does not satisfy the third requirement. For example, gamma maps P or not P to not. Uh, parentheses not PN not not P. Yeah, well. That's one of the things about intuitionism, you uh, get messed up on the uh, P or not P. And these are not intuitionistically equivalent. 
Formally, Woods incorporates a third refinement to a syntactic count of theoretical equivalents as follows. Two logical theories, L1 and L2, are syntactically equivalent relative to mappings T and U between logical expressions. When there are general translations t tau and sigma as before, additionally, for any S in the language L1, the theory generated by S according to L1, T, L1, S must be L1 equivalent to the theory one gets by translating the theory generated by S according to L2 in the language of L1. Okay, so sigma L2 to T, so, okay, the difference here is that, um, it's this right here. Um, they were using a T and U before, but now the uh, T and U is switched, so the translation of the expressions can't be, has to be, you have to be more careful about which one you're doing. You can't use the, uh, the understanding of the expression in the first language in the second language so when you're mapping back and forth you have to be more careful because um these two things aren't equivalent well they're equivalent in classical logic but not intuitionistically so you have to be careful when you're changing the expressions here that's what is going on the analogous equivalent according to l2 must for s in any language of l2 the theory tells and tau L2S are L1 equivalent for every uh, psi is element of TL1S. There's a sentence phi that is a segment of <laughs> sigma TL2S such that you've got, okay, so TL1 is equal, so the expressions here are equivalent, see, um, even though you've translated somehow between the two. Okay, but you have to be more careful about how, what, from where you think the translations are uh, starting and what they mean to understand where you can translate them back in between languages. So, but of course, intuitionist, intuitionistically and classically, when you start in the different positions, they won't ma match up because you're thinking differently about the logic and as said here, that you're not going to have uh, exactly the same sort of equivalences. It may be that the refined syntactic account of theoretical equivalence can distinguish between classical and intuitionistic logic. However, one can show that there are other intui intuitively distinct logical theories that Wood's proposal judges to be theoretically equivalent. That is, there are logical theories that are arguably distinct, arguably, and yet there are translations between them that satisfy these stronger syntactic conditions. I don't want them to be argu arguably distinct. They better be distinct. Otherwise, there's no point. I mean, there's a little bit of a hedge here. Uh, the most obvious cases are distinct logical theories that make exactly the same inferences valid. A well-known example compares classical logic, classical logic, and supervaluationist logic. Supervaluationist logic is non-classical because it allows sentences to be assigned a truth value other than true or false. This feature of supervaluationist logic makes it an attractive formal framework for, to capture reasoning with non-classical concepts like vague concepts and concepts of truth. Sentences that describe these non-classical concepts can take an intermediate truth value, and the semantics for supervaluation is logic to describe how this non-classical truth value works. Supervaluation of semantics is based on strong clean logic, a three-valued logic whose third value i is usually interpreted as indeterminate, indeterminate or neither true nor false. Strong clean logic defines consequence in the standard way as preserving truth across all models. Supervaluationist logic has more nuanced account of consequence, which gives, which is given in terms of supervaluations. Take any strong clean valuation v, which may assign some sentence a third value i. Let v less than or equal to v prime mean that v prime is a classical valuation, which agrees with the classical truth values that v assigns to sentences. The classical valuation v prime is called a precisification or resolution of v, as it resolves any of the indeterminacies in v. For any sentence phi that is not assigned true or false under v and so receives a third value i v prime assigns v a classical value let the supervaluation of sentence phi map v plus where v plus phi is equal to true if and only for all v prime such that v prime v is less than v prime v prime of phi equals true v plus uh, phi equal false for all v prime such that v is less than v for v prime is of phi is equal to false and it's I otherwise. Yeah, so that's fine. Well, it's just true, false, and I. Validity in supervaluation slash is then defined as follows. Uh, C, S implies, uh, given SV, uh, 
saw if and only if well as t double turn style only if, psi if only if every valuation v if v plus of phi equals true for all phi is l minus then v plus of psi is true so okay so look you've got a validity is true if it's a uh, for every valuation of v plus you get the same thing is mapped out for the um and all the valuations you get the same things kind of uh that you'd expect to for at least true interestingly while super valuation is logic is used to capture reason with non-classical concepts one can show that for any s and psi s implies psi if and only if psi is a classical consequence of s yeah see that's a thing if you're going to just talk about psi in terms of uh true well if it comes out true always in this thing you're always it's not an i and so you're going to get all the same classical results the difference between these logics is that when it's not true you're gonna you might have a maybe or an i or an indetermined and then you're gonna break with whatever because if it's not true in classic logic then it's just false but you have an i otherwise okay so, but otherwise, it's identical when it comes to the just true things. So, it follows that for any sentences S, the classical theory S is intertranslatable with the supervaluation theory. Because that theory is identical, one can apply the translation in both directions for this S valuation. Further, the, the identity translation satisfies three refinements that Woods pro proposes. Classical logic and supervaluation logic use the same logical expressions. The identity translation is a good translation that can be applied to any S. And the identity translation is not perverse as the resulting theories are identical and therefore logically equivalent according to both classical and supervaluationist logic. What the example of the classical and supervaluationist logic shows is that there are logics that are intuitively distinct but which satisfy very strong notions of syntactic equivalence. The suggestion that a purely syntactic approach distinguish cannot distinguish between some intuitively distinct logics. Okay, but why are they different exactly, and then what is the failure of the syntactic approach specifically? This is a counterexample, but it's not an explained counterexample because we haven't identified what within the uh, what exactly is breaking here. Unfortunately, it is apparent that a purely semantic approach cannot do this either. The semantic approach that I proposed in Wigglesworth 2017 is adopted from a standard account of semantic equivalence that one finds in philosophy of science and accounts and an account that appeals to category theory. Consider the theories uh, TL1S, TL2S generated by a set of sentences according to logs L1 and L2. Let mod L1S be the category of mod models of the theory of this, of T1, TL1 where the objects of mod L1S are the models of S given by the standard model theory for L1 and the arrows are homomorphisms between models. Similarly for the category mod L2S, these, ca these categories are equivalent if and only if there are functors F mod L1 to mod L2S and G mod L1 to L2S to mod L1S. So I said GF is semi-equivalent or whatever these things are. I don't know this logic. Uh, to one mod L1 and FG, but I mean you're just going back and forth between models is what you're doing here. That is the category is equivalent when there are functors between them whose comp compositions are naturally isomorphic to the identity functions of the respective categories. I suggested that two logics L1 L2 are semantically equivalent if and only if for all sentences S the category of models S as given by the model theory of L1 is equivalent in category theoretic sense to the category of models L S2 of category of models of S as given by the model theory of L2. One can then show that on this semantic account, classical intuition logics are not equivalent. Yeah, because the models won't be the same because they won't have the same um, things validating all the same stuff because you've got uh, different, when you've got a formula and you've got a model that sort of makes it true or false or uh, indetermined, it won't be the same stuff because they don't have the same... Uh, logical properties because the same formulas will be equivalent in one model but they won't be equi in, the, in one classical model and but they won't be the same formulas in the intuitionist mo intuitionistic model 
Unfortunately, this purely semantic criterion does not generalize to cover all cases. There are logical theories that satisfy this category theoretic condition for equivalence, but which are intuitively distinct. The most obvious cases are logics that appeal to the same category of, of models in order to develop their model theory. One example of this is given by supervaluationist logic, or more precisely, by two approaches to supervaluationist logic. So supervaluationism is really just throwing the monkey in the ranks here. Supervaluationism comes in several varieties depending on how key notions are defined. One of these notions is logical consequence. Above we define supervaluationist consequence as uh, the S is a consequence or implies that up implies earlier if and only for every valuation of V. If V plus of phi is true for all phi and S, then V plus phi uh, psi is true. Following Williamson's 1994 terminology, this gives us a global notion of supervaluation as consequence. One can also define a local notion of supervaluation as consequence. Uh, size consequence of, of S, S, V, if and only if for every evaluation, V for every precisification, V prime of V. If V prime is true for all psi in S, then V psi uh, in v, of v prime is true. <sighs> In the single, and this is why I try to avoid logical papers when reading. In the single conclusion case, the global and global, the local and global definitions of consequence are equivalent. However, in the multiple conclusion case, there are differences. Uh, multiple conclusion logic. Okay, a multiple conclusion inference S uh, R is, S implies R is a relation between two sets of sentences where R may contain more than one sentence. The intuitive idea is that multiple conclusion inference is valid if and only if every model that makes all the sentences of S true makes some of the sentences in R true. Defining the consequence in multiple conclusion terms gives us the following value variations on global and local supervaluation. S implies R if and only if for every valuation V in if V plus of, of phi equals true for all phi and S then V plus of psi is true for some psi and r and then we also have s implies r if and only for every valuation v for every precisification v prime of v if v prime of psi is true for all uh, phi in s then v prime of psi is true for some phi in r okay so we've got yeah for every precisification versus not every precisification <laughs> These definitions of supervaluous consequence do not match up as there are multiple conclusion inferences that are valid according to the second different definition but invalid according to the first. For example, the inference from phi or not phi implies phi, uh, phi comma not phi is locally valid but globally invalid. Consider the valuation that assigns phi the third value i so that not phi is also i but um, phi or not phi is true because you're taking the... Uh, Remember, it's a uh, less than or equal to, so you're getting, um, yeah. well, however you, you're assigning this, this is going to be true because you're going to have, it's not going to get a, a, a false value on this. So it's like I or I. Yeah. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Here we have two different logs because they make different inferences valid, given by two different. Let me. Am I, am I being clear about this? I don't know. So you got multiple conclusions here. You can see that. So this, this or this implies these two conclusions. These two conclusions locally valid but globally invalid. Okay. So let me just see. Yeah. See, the processification would make this um classically true. So you're not going to get like both of these off this in the classical one but in the uh for some phi and r psi and r so it's you're gonna get the multiple conclusions here because there is some sort of uh there are some things that do come out true i hope i i hope i'm right about that here we have two different logics because they make different inferences valid given by two different definitions of logical consequence over the same collection of models. Yeah, I can't think very well at any time of day, really, but what are you going to do? 
Unfortunately for the purely semantic approach, there is no way to capture the difference in category theoretic framework given above. Both local and global supervaluationisms use the exact same category of models to assign truth values to sentences. It follows that for any sentence S, sentences S, the category of local supervaluation models and the category of global super, global supervaluation models are more than equivalent in the category of theoretic sense. They're identical. The standard semantic criterion for theoretic equivalence given in terms of category theory, therefore, judges local and global supervaluation to be equivalent, where intuitively they should not be. Yeah, because you've got the same, same sort of stuff, but you're slicing it up different. The difference between local and global supervaluations logic is given by how they define logical consequence. Yeah, so when you start um, getting consequences of these things, even though they start with the same world, the same model, you're breaking it up differently uh, based on how uh, consequence works. Unfortunately, because categorical equivalence only focuses on models as objects and on homomorphisms between models, the distinction between local and global supervaluation, given in terms of definition of con consequence, is lost. Yeah because you're not talking about consequence when you're talking about this other stuff, the models. This problem will generalize to any distinct logics given by different definitions of logical consequence over the same category of models. Yeah, so if you start with the, uh, as, as above, if you start trying to change the connectives, then you're going to end up with different models. If you hold the connectives, the models uh, stable like you just uh, said, but then you can mess with the connectives, and that way you're still getting different logics. So, okay, so we're talking about like the connectives versus the models, which uh, make things true, and so either holding one stable, changing the other, and then swipping, swapping the uh, situation. To take an example that does not require multiple conclusion inferences, consider strong clean logic and Grand Priest logic of Paradox LP. Both logics in their single multiple conclusion versions define logical consequence of the same category of models. The log, yeah, they do. The lo the logics differ with respect to their d designated truth values. The truth values that must be preserved for an inference to be valid. Strong clean requires the preservation of truth values. Truth from the premises to the conclusion, while LP requires that if the premises are true or take the third value i, then the conclusion must be true or take the third value i. The difference results in the clog logics making different in inferences valid. For example, modus ponens. For example, modus ponens. The inference from phi and phi implies psi to psi is valid in strong clean, but invalid in LP. Unfortunately, as before, there doesn't seem to be any way to capture this difference in the category theoretic framework. What these cases show is that there are logics that are intuitively distinct, but would satisfy very strong notions of semantic equivalence. Yeah, the same sort of stuff uh, in clean and uh, LP. This suggests that a purely semantic approach cannot distinguish between some intuitively distinct logics. As, as there appear to be counterexamples to both purely syntactic and purely semantic accounts of theoretical equivalence, it is likely that in that the case of logical theories it may be necessary to combine syntactic and semantic components. Join forces! Yay! One option to combine syntactic and semantic and semantics invokes the category theoretic notion of an institution. What is an institution in logic? I have not heard this before. An institution is an ordered tuple I. Sig, sen, mod implies sig is a category of signatures or languages sen is a what is it, like a senators and like uh signatories to a like a uh constitution or something senator is sen is a function from the category sig to the category set of sets mod is a contravariant function from sig to the category cat of categories and uh, this symbol is a collection of satisfaction relations, symboly sigma for every signature sigma in sig. Okay. Institutions combine the syntactic and semantic components by building in the relationship between formal languages given by sig and models given by mod. Okay, so we're just making, you're basically just pulling everything together that you had above in this thing you're calling an inti institution I. Okay. Yeah, so you've got the models from just above, the uh, implication symbol or consequence um, there. Uh, this is the sig is just the set of languages and send is the function, the tau from above. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. 
So it's just a big old happy family now. Question is, is combining everything a really a good idea? Because you're making a mess of syntactic and semantics, which is, you know, people try to keep these things separate because they are different concepts, but, um, yeah, we'll find out. A logic or logical theory can be understood as an institution. You see, this is just a very sort of pregnant word, institution. It's got like a lot of weight behind it. I'm not, it, it might be clever, I don't know. Each component of an institution is relatively straightforward because institutions are supposed to be quite abstract and flexible. They allow for logics in which the signatures, the signature can vary. For this reason, SIG can contain multiple distinct signatures. The morphisms of SIG can be given by any function between signatures as long as it satisfies the usual category theoretic conditions on morphisms. The existence of identity morphisms, the composition of morphisms, etc. For each signature SIG, Ma in sig sen sigma gives us the sigma se sigma sentences the well-formed formulas of the signature mod sigma gives us the models of sigma the consequences the that the consequences of sigma captures and the consequences of sigma captures the model theoretic notion of satisfaction that, that holds between all models and sentences logical consequence is then given semantically in terms of the sentences that the models satisfy Institutions are able to capture an incredibly wide range of logics, including classical propositional logics, classical first order, higher order logics, non classical logics like intuitionist logics, modal logics, and many value logics like clean and supervaluation logic, fuzzy logic. A particular logic is given by defining the models and the satisfaction relation. For example, for classical propositional logic, the models of a signature mod sig comprise functions from sigma to the set 0, 1. For classical first order, the models uh, are Tarskian models. In both cases, satisfaction is given in the usual way. For intuition, it's logic, the models are Kripke structures, and satisfaction is possible world satisfaction. Okay, so just sort of building in all the logics, all the logics into this uh, little grouping of things, because you've got the syntactic stuff and the semantic stuff in your institution. Not only can institutions capture a wide range of locks, one can also define an equivalence relation on institutions. An equivalence between two institutions, I J, comprises a comorphism from I J that satisfies certain conditions. A comorphism, uh, capital Phi Alpha Beta from I to J, includes a function, capital Phi from Sig 1 to Sig J, a natural mod transformation from Alpha from sen i to sen j dot sigma and a natural transformation beta from mod j dot sigma op to mod i yeah additionally the following satisfaction conditions must hold for each signature sigma in sig in each model m in mod j sigma uh, phi sigma and each sentence sigma in sen i sigma this formula um the model implies for J, a capital sigma sig, alpha sigma phi, if and only if beta sigma m i here. So what we're doing is we're going from back and forth between J and I um, for in this. So, yeah. Yeah, so we're going back and forth between these things. Essentially, this condition requires that M satisfies the image of sigma under the transformation alpha, if and only if the image of M under the transformation beta satisfies this. So we've just, you've got some transformations for all the different little pieces going on here. Equivalence between institutions is then defined as the existence of a comorphism between them that satisfies all the following conditions. Capital Phi is an equivalence of categories. Alpha Sigma has an inverse up to semantic equivalence, which is natural in Sigma, and Beta Sigma is an equivalence of categories. This relation of institutional equivalence matches our intuitions about the equivalence of logical theories in many cases. For example, classical propositional and first order logs are not equivalent under their intuitionist counterparts. Using institutions for many valued logics, one can also distinguish between classical supervalues and strong clean logics. So the notion of an institutional equivalence gets it right in cases where we want to say certain logics are not equivalent. It also gets it right in cases where we want to say certain logics are equivalent. For example, we would like different presentations of classical propositional logic. Excuse me. 
for example, that take different sets of logic as primitive to be equivalent logical theories. Treating logics as institutions can do this. One can show that classical propositional logic, given in terms of disjunction, negation, and true, when understood as an institution, is equivalent to classical propositional logic, given in terms of conjunction, negation, and false. Given this, these successes, understanding logical theories in terms of institutions is an attractive alternative that combines syntactic and semantic components. Okay, look, you've just combined the syntactic and semantic pro proponent components and done it in a way that you get like you're trying to get the best of both worlds here. Institutions give us a unified approach that gets it right in the case where purely syntactic and purely semantic approaches fail. The arguments presented in Wiggles were 2017 and Woods 2018 are given in the context of a view known as logical anti-exceptionalism. Anti-exceptionalism about logic takes logical theories to be continuous with scientific theories. If one has this view of logical theories, it is reasonable to examine them with respect to the debate to debate in the philosophy of science that focus on scientific structure of scientific theories. These debates have concentrated on two approaches, the so-called received view, which takes a purely syntactic approach, and the semantic view, which takes a purely sem semantic approach. The two approaches diverge considerably in their understanding of the nature, the structure of scientific theories, and the debate as to which approach is preferable continues to be a lively one. However, in the special case of logical theories, the above considerations suggest that an approach which combines syntactic and semantic components is to be preferred. Well, that's what you preferred. Um, well, what are the formal categorical category theoretic notion of an institution coupled with the suitable a suitable equivalence relation of institution combined offers a combined approach that matches at many of our intuitions about which logical theories are and are not equivalent. These results make a strong case for the approach that understands logical theories in terms of institutions. Um, yeah, so what you're doing is, as I just said, is it's getting to be just sort of let's take the best of both worlds and put it together. This usually is a nice stopgap, but there's usually deeper problem. There's often deeper problems when it comes to this stuff. It's not just a question of getting it right with what we have now. It's going to be getting it right in the future, and that's why we have two different uh, approaches. Like the res research is not in combining them. It's sort of deepening the syntactic theories or deepening the um, semantic theories and seeing what you can get out of these two methods of doing it. If you combine it, it's sort of like saying, "Well, sure, we're done now because we just have all the stuff we want." So. It's a good thing to do, but I didn't see any insight into why one is working sometimes and the other is working other times and getting at the underlying, uh, something underlying that would give us a more interesting understanding of uh, what it is to be a logic and a logical, uh, indiv individuating a logic. So c combining it is a practical thing to do, but I'm not um, super, um, it's like, this is a very nice essay, but I'm just not a, like, a, I don't think it's going to have a whole lot of legs, frankly. But okay, uh, thanks for watching, leave me a suggestion for what to read next if you would like. Have a good day, stay safe out there.